Good morning, friends. All right. How was worship? I thought so, too. I thought so, too. I'm excited. I hope you're excited because I'm going to hit you today. Anybody come in the mood to be hit? No, you didn't. I'm just kidding. (laughs) But you never know. Um, If you have your Bibles this morning, and I hope that you do, um, I'm going to, I'm going to lead out here in Colossians three. Um, I'm going to run past our theme verse in just a second here for the series. This is the last week of our under the influence series. And, um, how many of you know, not, not all your thoughts are your own. All right, not everybody knows that. I'm excited to share with you this morning because this is, this is going to, um, I'm hoping we get some illumination uh, on some things this morning. And, um, and one of them is not all your thoughts are your own. I want to start here. I'm, um, uh, stay in Colossians 3. I'm just going to hit Hebrews 5.14. I don't want to get lost in the weeds. And I'm going to say this real briefly. Um, my first pass on this in the 9 o'clock service, we went in a particular direction, and I kind of camped out in Hebrews 5.14 for a little while. So um, if you want a little bit kind of more uh, depth on that particular word um, to kind of frame where we're going to go, um, feel free to get that disc or, you know, go, um, go on the live stream, go on our YouTube channel, um, and you can check that out. I think we're now journeychurchnewny.com, journeychurchny.com if you want to check that out. Um, but, uh, but I want to skate past it because there's a number of things I want to kind of hit um, today uh, in the 11 um, service. So bear with me. Uh, it says in Hebrews 5.14, but solid food, someone say yum, belongs to those who are of full age. That is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. All right, another translation reads it this way, but solid food, someone say yum, is for the mature Um, who because of practice have their senses trained to discern good and evil. I want to unpack just a couple things briefly. Um, Someone say, don't get lost in the weeds. All right, okay, I'm going to really try hard not to rabbit trail this one. It's just really hard. When a teacher gets going on scripture, it's really hard to kind of pull them out of it. Um, So the word mature means having reached its end, complete, perfect, or wanting nothing necessary to completeness. And I want to say right off the bat, God is more interested in your maturity and my maturity than he is in our comfort. (sighs) Okay. Our Western world thrives on making us comfortable, thrives on taking us out of pain. And if you and I are genuinely going to grow up into all things Christ, as is his intention... You will have a season of time when you're first believing things of God. You'll have a season of time where he is. He's going, to, he's going to be the comforter for your pain and pull you out of pain. But as we mature, he wants to be our comforter in our affliction. He wants to be our comforter through our affliction. And so there's, there's an understanding that develops in the, in the people of God um, ooh, that, that moves us from, um, I thought at some point I would just be grown up enough that stuff wouldn't happen to me anymore. And instead, it's the, some things that happen to us that he partners. He comes in alongside and he's like, I got you. We'll do this together. Jesus himself said, in this world, you will have trouble. Come on, Jesus. That's just not fair. Like, I mean, you, you ever come across scriptures where you're like, I wish he hadn't said that. And then to double down, it's red letters. You know what I mean? Like, it's hard to disagree with the red letters. And so he didn't say, you may have trouble, Curtis. He didn't say, after a certain point of trials, like once you mature enough, I'll be like, I'll just take them off your plate. and be like, you just, you just run now. And he didn't say that. He said, in this world, you will have trouble. And he said, but take heart, I've overcome the world. And so there's a mystery to be stepped into where we no longer look at our American dream-chasing existence as a um, how many times can I get out of jail free as much as um, if I happen to go to jail, I hope it's because I'm being persecuted and not because I messed up. And 
I can count on my Jesus to be there with me in, in the mess, in the thick of it. Someone say maturity. He's more interested in our maturity than he is in our comfort. All right. I find it interesting that in order to discern good and evil, in order to actually have the, the word senses there means organ of perception. Uh, my, I, I actually have spiritual ability. You and I have spiritual ability. We have spiritual senses that can pick up when something's good, when something's evil, and that's trained by what I eat. It said solid food is for the mature, and it's the solid food that actually leads us to be able to discern what's good What's evil? You, you all right? I know, we're going to be a little thinker for a little bit. I promise. We'll come up for air on occasion, and then we'll kind of go back in the water. And, okay. So, I don't eat. I don't, <laughs> twice. Um, I don't eat in the natural for things spiritual. So it begs the question, where's this solid food? Scripture's really clear. If you read the first couple of verses, the verses immediately prior, it talks about the word of righteousness, meaning what you and I are trained by one another to step into levels of maturity based on the words that we can actually manage. He was chastising the Hebrews, and he was saying, listen, you, you, you still need milk. You can't handle solid food yet, and i got to keep feeding you milk like an infant. And what's the main difference between, what are some of the main differences between an infant who's drinking milk, and we have one right now, so this is really present on my mind. What's the difference, main differences between an infant who needs milk and a, child, and a child growing into an adult that can actually eat solid food? Well, for one, they've got teeth. Eventually we grow teeth. Eventually we grow the ability to actually chew on the things that are deeper to, uh, to be able to go past just the elemental things. One of the, um, one of the other um, differences is when you're an infant, you always have someone feeding you. One of the main things we have to discover as we become children and then adults in God is that we actually have to learn how to feed ourselves. Even if it's somebody else giving me a word, I actually have to learn how to grab that word, receive it to myself, and begin to marinate and chew on that word internally until it becomes something that I can, I can bring out and bear fruit. I'm staying high and spiritual just for a second there. We're going to get to some real life in just a second. But I want to, um, I, I want to make sure that we're, we're really understanding. If we're going to enter into maturity, somebody say maturity. It's going to require a different mindset than most of what we've had prior. Main difference between an adult and a child is an adult can go out and find their own resources to get their own food, to make their own food, to eat their own food. Selah. Whew. So have you guys been enjoying this under the Influence series. It's just like, this is a little bit more of a deeper dive than we've typically gone. Um, we had Donna, week one, talk about miscommunication. Did you know that we have a problem around here with miscommunication? I wish I could say I didn't think that was the case, but she was right on the money with her dream that she shared about that. Um, and one of the things that she really uh, provoked for us to listen to, think about, be inspired to, is in this season of transition to release the opposite and actually communicate in stronger ways than we ever have. And I would even encourage every single person in this room, since miscommunication is something that we've typically dealt with around here, I would, I would, embrace, I would encourage everyone here to embrace a season where you over-communicate. Really, one of the things that I tell my voice students all the time, like um, uh, on occasion, and this is about a fourth or a fifth of the students that I see, um, when I'm teaching, they'll, they'll barely open their mouth and they sing. It's like they're from the school of ventriloquism, and I'm like, that won't, that won't work as a singer, okay? And so when I say open your mouth, that might go from like this to this. And I'm like, okay, I want you to open your mouth more than you think is, is necessary. 
like what feels abnormal to you. Do you understand? When we're so used to a normal that is restricted and restrictive, we can get so used to something like miscommunication as a cultural element in, in our dealing that the idea of communicating might seem like a stretch. And so to, so to actually go beyond that, if we begin to over-communicate, we might actually hit the actual mark. Okay, all right, bear with me. So that was week one, and then we had, um, and we had Scott come in week two. I love Scott. I actually pulled this line. I loved when he said this. You can't come in my heart unless you come through the doorway of peace. I just like that word in the atmosphere, so I'm going to say it again. You can't come in my heart unless you come through the doorway of peace. Yeah. Peace is not the, peace is not the absence of conflict. It's the presence of Holy Spirit. It says that the kingdom of heaven is not eating or drinking, but it is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. So peace is not, oh, we stopped fighting and therefore our home has peace. Peace is Holy Spirit reigns. Yeah, that felt good to say, Pastor Jane. All right. Dave warned us last week to discern good and evil. We need to watch our comfort levels. How comfortable have we become with certain things? And I love that Dave walked through, ooh, this is going to segue beautifully. Thank you, Jesus. I love how Dave walked us through the various deeds of the flesh and then before highlighting the fruits of the Spirit. Do you know after we go through the list of the fruits of the Spirit, and I may have them out of order here, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, right? I think I got that. It says right after that, a part that most people miss. Against such things, there is no law. So many of us have tried to live lives of barely getting by, of barely surviving from Sunday to Sunday in our life with Jesus, believing um, a lie that says, I have to keep just not sucking. I have to just avoid sin as much as I possibly can. And that's not the abundant life Jesus offered us. When it says in Scripture, it was for freedom that he set us free. He was setting us free from an entire paradigm where you and I were locked. We were gridlocked under a system where there was no, there was no way out of our sinful condition. There was no way out. And it says it was for freedom that he set us free, meaning there is a whole realm of life to live in. There's a whole arena of life to live in that Paul can say, against such things there is no law. Listen, if you and I are walking led by the Spirit and we're constantly exuding love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and self-control, what are people going to say about you? There's no law against such things. There's nothing um, in that reality of life that can come against you. All right. <laughs> Are you in Colossians 3? So glad. If then, someone say if then. I love this because he's leaving the option just in case we weren't. If then you were raised with Christ... Seek those things. One of, some of your translations say, keep seeking those things which are above where Christ is. Someone say where he is. Sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things in the earth. All right. So I got a little visual aid for you. One of the things that we come to understand about Scripture is that there are three different, separate, but overlapping realities to all of existence. You and I are mostly and woefully aware of one in particular. First heaven. What's known as first heaven, also known as earth. Um, in Genesis, it says he separated the waters from the waters, from the waters from one another. So, like, my read on that is typically... Okay, so once he started creation, one of the things that he did is he separated, he put, he put one set of waters below, he put one set of waters above. So like he, he began to separate these things out. We've got the first heaven, which you and I can see and we can sense and we can actually 
engage with, with our senses, with our five senses. The second heaven is the realm of angelic and demonic warfare. We're typically not super aware of this one, but we're going to come back to that in just a second. And then we've got the third heaven, also known as the kingdom realm. Now, these three, thing, these three levels um, are, the, um, are the broad stroke of reality, and yet we're usually only concerned and aware of one of them. Give you a little bit of Bible for those of you that are like, eh? Paul, I believe at the end of 2 Corinthians, don't quote me, but go find it, um, talks about, he says, a man I know was caught up to the third heaven where he heard sounds that were inexpressible, meaning a man, Paul, caught up to the third heaven realm and he experienced things that he could not actually articulate with words in a way that would reflect what he saw. That should give you a hint, that should give us a hint as to how extraordinary the kingdom of heaven is. We think of heaven as this place that's clouds, like white clouds, and Cupid-looking angels, not stupid-looking, Cupid-looking, Cupid-looking angels, and everything is like light and airy and fluffy, and there's like, there's no pain, which there isn't, and it's all joyful, which it is. Um, but the, but we, we largely have, we've, we've diminished our concept of heaven to be, um, I'm free from pain. Paul goes there and hears and experiences things that have no earthly way to express the extraordinary magnitude, magnificence, beauty that he's beholding. We've, we've, we've barely scratched the surface on understanding how amazing this place is. Now, if that weren't enough, prior to the cross, you and I were victims of constant airstrikes from the enemy. If the enemy wanted to come at us, he's, he's got the high ground. So, so he can just drop all kinds of issues into our lives, all kinds of uh, circumstances all, into our lives, all kinds of resistance into our life, and we have no recourse. Jesus comes along completely, I'm going to pick up, I'm going to pick up Dave's language because I really feel like it's the word of the Lord in this, for this season, completely changes the rules of the game completely changes the rules of the game. And so now, you and I can be kicking it down here, and there might still be airstrikes, but when, the moment you said yes to Jesus, you said yes here, but your spirit came alive here. I'm really going to do this. That, that, that's the extent of, this is the extent of my visual artistic ability, okay? I'm, I'm going to make him happy. Let's make him a woman. She happy, all right? Because in Ephesians 1, it says that Jesus is seated in heavenly places, third heaven. In Ephesians 2, it says that you and I are seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. We're the only beings anywhere on planet earth that exist in two places at the same time. This is why Paul could say, old things have gone, new things have come. Like you're a new creation if you're in Christ Jesus because you exist here and there. For those of you that haven't tuned out yet, this should be a mind blow. No, because we're used to those cushy chairs right there. We're used to Monday morning issues at work. We're used to my kid won't stop crying. We're used to my, my spouse and I won't stop fighting. We're used to this entirely visible realm down here. And there's two-thirds of reality that we're scarcely aware of. Not all thoughts are your own. I'm going to invite you into my world yesterday for just a second here. I took a, um, my family and I took a run up to Syracuse because uh, my phone got fixed at the Apple service providers. They did it for free. Hallelujah, Jesus. Um, I know some of you. Some of you are either gritting your teeth because you've had your phone fixed, but it cost you a fortune, or you had to buy a new phone. I get it. I'm, I've been there too. Um, but we go up to uh, pick up my phone, and something very interesting happens. We, um, if you don't know, we're we're kind of like a, a 
we're, we have a strong affection for all things Disney in our house. That's just, that's kind of, a, that's kind of our jam. And, um, and so we went to the Disney store while we were there because, let's face it, we just had two very young children in the car for two hours. They rocked some naps, but then we, we got there. We're like, we got we to gotta make sure they run, run around a little bit, right? Now, interestingly, now she's never done this any other time, but once Aubrey hits the Disney store, like tunnel vision, like a visual vortex, she centers on one kiosk right near the front of the store that's these 12 to 14 inch dolls of various Disney princesses and figures. And, and she never does this. She never fixates like this. But she, and she, she finds um, the best one, Elena of Avalor, which is the new Hispanic Disney princess. It's the be, it's the, she's the best one out there. Watch the show. You'll, just, you'll love it. And so she fixates and she's like, I want it. And, and, she, and she spends probably the next 20 minutes trying to convince us to buy it. Meanwhile, we're like, there's other things to look at. I mean, we're like, we're, we're just going through. We're, shot, we're just like looking to see what's here. We're like, we're not, we're not really going to like buy anything today. Um, and so <laughs> we're, we're trying to like distract her with all the things that she would normally like. I mean, we, we got one moment of reprieve because Frozen 2 is coming out. That was exciting. They had a little, you know, a little trailer on that. That was exciting. So, but she's fixated to the point of tears, to the point of, I've got to have this, and we're not leaving. Like, she's not saying this word, but you can tell. We're not leaving until she gets this. She didn't get it, just so you know. But I'm fascinated by this, but, but at the same time, I'm thinking, oh, maybe she's just tired, maybe, you know, whatever. It's exhausted. Maybe she's exhausted, whatever. Now, here's what happens. We get back to the car, and I have to pause to feed Asher a bottle before we get back on the road. So I'm in the front seat feeding Asher, and like a light switch, she's happy, bright. Like, coming over to her brother, she's being affectionate, she's kissing him. She, I mean, I'm telling you, like, the countenance shift was, you're, you're like, what just happened? And, all, like, almost at the same time, Alden says, while I'm thinking, it must have been the atmosphere of them all. Because we had walked on... Okay? We had walked into a place that had an atmosphere designed to make you and I covet what's there. So she comes under an atmosphere that, that, that begins to demand, you got to have this. You got to have this and you got to have it now. If you don't leave with this, you got, you got to have it. And like, we're a little bit more resilient. I mean, we can walk into a Disney store and there might be a couple of things that we're like, ooh, hey. Hi, cool, hi. Hmm. But... But we're like, we're not walking out of there with hundreds of dollars of things. So we're fine. Our countenance has not shifted, but we're, we're noticing this, and we're like, wow, look at, look at the change. Just from going from one environment, one atmosphere, one influence to another. So fast forward. We get driving home, and we hit the southern tier. And her countenance falls again. And by, and by the time we got home, again, and maybe part of it was tired, but this was uncharacteristic for her, even when she's tired, she goes into weeping inconsolably, and nothing has provoked this. So finally, Alden's got her on her bed, because we're getting the kids ready for their second nap. She's got her on her bed, and she's like, okay, what, what's in your heart? What's, what's, what's going on in your heart? What's, what's, what's making you hurt? And she begins to name a person in her life that's really important to her because of something that they're going through. And if you don't know, I'm just going to kind of give this to us. One of the main spiritual entities, and I'm talking wicked forces now, in our valley is hopelessness and depression. So we come back into the valley this thing starts, begins to influence her. So by the time she gets home, she begins to feel hopeless for this person, and she begins to, like, weep for them. So my wife, being the, being the intercessor that she is and having read Benny Johnson's Happy Intercessor, begins to recognize, okay, I got I to gotta talk. I got to walk her through how to feel this but actually go to the Lord and use this as information to say, okay, I'm going to pray for this person and then release those feelings back to God. It's a beautiful thing, right? This ends up, this ends up taking place, and we're, we're, we're good to go. She gets her nap. Now, three different atmospheres all influenced this little heart, 
right? How often, say, some of you parents just got delivered. You're like, oh, I thought my kid was just rotten every time we went to the toy store. You know, like, <laughs> no, listen, listen, first, <laughs> I just, sorry. You know, like Jesus discerning the thoughts, I picked a couple thoughts out of the air that were kind of like, yeah, you don't know my kids, so. Um, <laughs> listen. Children are children. They're growing. They, um, and obviously it's, it's incumbent upon us to come alongside, to correct, to discipline, to, to, to shape them into the people that they're destined to become. It's part of the reason why the father is known in John 15 as a vine dresser. Um, because he's there to actually prune the places that aren't bearing fruit in our lives. This is like, this is how we do this, right? So anyway, um, but parents, you're not bad parents. You may have just walked into a contrary atmosphere. Just needed to give someone in the room hope on that today. All right. So we walked into atmospheres that exerted influence. And I say all that to say there are atmospheres every single day, beloved, listen, there's atmospheres every single day that we walk into, that we engage with over the phone, um, that we have relationally, like people, single individuals can carry atmospheres. <laughs> Sometimes you're like, they can carry more than one. You know, like we, we engage with these things all day, but if we're not aware of what is happening here or what could be influencing here, then we might write it off as that person's just a jerk or, or you know, or I, I just, I can't stand my job or, you know, any number of things can be happening. Meanwhile, we just don't have the information because we're not aware because these two realms are invisible to us. Now, the beautiful part of living on this side of the cross is we don't have to get caught up here because we can think from here. We can hear from here. If we're seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus, it means that we have access through Holy Spirit to the voice of Yeshua, the voice of the shepherd who can give us the information. He can give us when the enemy comes in, it says in Isaiah, like a flood, God raises up a standard against him. What if you're the standard that he's going to raise up against the enemy? I am going to preach it. So it's incumbent upon us to become really aware of these, these two realms. This will give us information as to what we're dealing with. This one will give us the answers. Okay, all right. I want to fast forward over to Luke chapter 9, and we're going we're gonna to fly now. Because I want to make sure we get to our practicals today, because this is our last week in the series. I want to make sure we walk out of here armed, not just with awareness, but some, maybe some things that we can do. Um, in dealing with these things. When you're in Luke chapter 9, um, say, yeah. <laughs> okay. And I'm starting in verse 51, 5 1. Now it came to pass when the time had come for him to be received up that he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. We're talking about Jesus here. And sent messengers before his face. And as they went, they entered a village of the Samaritans to prepare for him. But they did not receive him because his face was set for the journey to Jerusalem. And when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them just as Elijah did? But he turned and rebuked them and said, you do not know what manner of spirit you are of. Somebody say spirit. For the son of man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village. All right. Here's my sobering thought. You can be walking with Jesus himself and propose an agenda that is entirely satanic, believing all the while that you're advocating kingdom advancement. These guys had walked with Jesus now for years. They knew how he rolled. They knew his ministry. They knew what was going down. They knew how he worked. And here's the guys that Jesus actually nicknamed the sons of thunder. So you know, like, they're not kidding when they say, let's call down fire from heaven. You know, if Jesus calls you sons or daughters of thunder, you know, you must be bold. You must be bold. You must have, like, a faith that you're, like, you, you're going to believe God that you can actually bring down fire from heaven. <laughs> Jesus is like, Whoa! 
Where did that come from? For that, we need some context. In that day and age, the rivalry between Judea and Samaria was real. Samaritans were considered half-breeds. People who were half Jew and, maybe, and, and then maybe had, had lineage from another uh, pagan nation. The Jews were Jews. They, they intermarried. Uh, they, they, married, they, married, they married Jew. They, they had families who were Jewish, etc. All right. And so there was a particular animosity between the two people groups. Um, one, of the, one of the places we pick this up is in John 4 when we've got the woman at the well and she says, well, your people say that they ought to worship in Jerusalem. My people say on this mountain over here. And so that was one of the main points of contention. So when people typically traveled to Jerusalem, but Samaria was in the way, they would actually usually go around Samaria entirely. They would circumvent, circumvent entirely. In this case, Jesus is fixed on Jerusalem because he knows this is what I came for and it's time to go do what I came for. And so he goes through Samaria, and I'm, I gotta wonder if, like, if this was in his plans. Like, you know, why, why pass through Samaria otherwise? You just gotta take a couple extra days, and you'll eventually get there, and you'll go die. You know what I mean? Like, you don't have to go through Samaria. But here's Jesus. He's like, nope, straight shot. Let's go. And it says that the people in that city did not receive him. And so what happened? There was an atmosphere in Samaria of rejection towards Jews. There was a dome of rejection. There was, a, there was an atmosphere. There's a spiritual influence of Samaritans. Essentially, we'll just call it spirit of racism. That when, when Jews came under that, under that particular umbrella, that atmosphere rose up and said, we don't want you here. Now, we're going to get here in just a second. One of the ways that demonic influences work is they want to provoke you to action. They don't want you to think longer than a few seconds to respond. They want to provoke you by their spirit. And what happens is, is, is if the, it's like a fishing line. If, if the demonic influence swings out its influence and can hook your heart, what it does is it hooks you, and now it makes you respond in the same spirit. So what happened? They come under a particular, particular influence. James and John, sons of thunder though they are, walking side by side with Jesus, they come under this umbrella of influence. And they're like, you reject us? Jesus, say the word. We'll call down fire from heaven just like Elijah did. What happened? They got rejected. They felt the sting of it. And now they're going to respond in the same spirit. Only they're walking with spiritual atomic bombs. Guys, I believe they could have. Jesus is like, whoa, slow down. First of all, you said like Elijah did. Elijah didn't pour down fire to wipe out a people group. When Elijah called down fire, he called down fire because he wanted Israel to know who the real God was. He was trying to turn an entire people group back towards God. You're trying to wipe out an entire people group. Not like Elijah did it. Hashtag read your Bible. Malachi 4, 5, and 6 actually says, before the great and terrible day of the Lord, I will, I will send you Elijah, and he will restore the hearts of the fathers to the sons and the sons to the fathers. The spirit of Elijah calling down fire is going to do so in a way that reconciles generations, not actually tears a whole town apart. You don't know what spirit you have. Now, husbands and wives... Some of you are going to be tempted. Some of you are going to be tempted. You, you just heard that word I just released. Some of you are going to be tempted to be like in your, in your intense fellowship. Please don't say, you don't know what spirit you have. We're just going to say from, from experience, that doesn't work so well. Doesn't work so well. I am going to give you a key in just a second here in Proverbs 15.1 that will actually give you some more to work with with regards to that, but don't use that one. Don't use that one. Young people, same thing with Psalm 139. Don't go up to some girl or some, uh, some hottie boy and say, you are fearfully and wonderfully made. Please don't. Please don't. Je Jesus isn't approving that. He's laughing at you. He may be like, you got no game. All right. All right. 
Let's get into some tools. Uh, if you've been taking notes, now's the time to take notes. These are, these are some practical things that we can do um, to keep our atmosphere clean, clear, led by Holy Spirit. Someone say, Holy Spirit. Listen, at the end of the day, we only want to be led by one spirit. At the end of the day, there's only one spirit that belongs, not just residing within us, but the one who's actually determining the course of our life. I actually found myself singing in worship today. Um, I, don't want, I don't want any other wind but the wind of the Holy Spirit um, in my sails. I don't want any other wind, no other influence, no other directional inf influence on my life than Holy Spirit's wind, his, his breath. So here's some tools on keeping our atmosphere clear, clean, and led by Holy Spirit. Number one, when provoked, and I'm using that word on purpose multiple times because it's, it's, a, it's, a real key, it's a real key move of the enemy. When you're provoked, disrupt the flow of time and tempo. Tempo is just a musical word for pace. Um, use the woman caught in adultery, right? So there was a lot of, it was, it was an up-tempo, furious um, occasion. The woman caught in adultery, Pharisees, a bunch of Pharisees, pull her out of the very act, okay? They don't bring the dude, just the woman, but they pull her out of the very act, and they drag her, half-dressed, if that, through the marketplace. Now, by this point, now, like, once people catch sight of this, you know mob, you know mob mentality. And when a culture has specifically targeted a particular issue, Oh, he, who, he or she who has ears to hear, let them hear. When a culture has targeted a specific issue, we will go after that one specific issue. Oh, man, I'm just going to say this. If we're going to go after one area of sexual perversion or identity confusion, let's go after them all. Let's not, let's, not, let's not hold a particular political banner against certain people groups unless we're actually going to deal with adultery and pornography, unless we're going to deal with sex trafficking, unless we're going to deal with the entire issue of the way that God created each man and woman, then let's not target a specific people group as more sinful than another? All right. So there's a pace. There's a, there's a quick tempo to what's going on in this particular scenario. And so they come, that you, can, you can see the dust being kicked up in their heels, and they come and they drag her. They throw her before Jesus. And what's the first thing Jesus does? We have no idea what he drew in the sand. Scholars have been speculating for centuries. We have no idea what he drew in the sand. What we do know is with that mob mentality, you ever notice when things are really heated that your rational mind comes in a couple minutes later? You know what I mean? Like you might be flying off at the mouth. You might be just flying off at so-and-so. You might have that outburst of anger, but your rational mind hasn't actually come with you. Your spirit hasn't caught up. Do you notice this? Like our spirit kind of like, moves at the same pace all the time, whereas our emotions could be like miles down the road. And so Jesus is kind of giving everybody just a brief moment of time to catch their breath and say, maybe this isn't what we're going to do today. What did he do? He disrupted the time and the flow. So when you're provoked, someone say when. Notice I said when and not if. One of the things every single person in the room has in common is that at some point we've all been and are going to be provoked. Give yourself time to think and respond rather than impulsively react. I want you to know that I'm practicing what I preach on this. Um, about a week ago, I got blasted on Facebook. I mean, out of the blue, didn't see it coming, blasted. And... Do you know that indignation that is on the inside of you that rises up, that's like, uh oh, I'm going to defend myself? Like, women who have, like, the large earrings, you know what I mean? Like, where you start, when, when you start, when you, I'm just saying in general, I'm not saying it's only one culture, I'm just, but you know what I'm talking, no, no, like, I was looking all around the room. 
But if you have, like, you know what I'm talking about? When the, when the earrings start coming off, you know it's on. That's what I'm talking about here. I got blasted, and if I had long, ho large hoop earrings, they were coming out. And so I... I found myself face to face with my own preaching. I found myself face to face with, okay, you've been talking for years about how to handle persecution, if you ever handle it. And here it is. You didn't know it was coming. And you, you feel all those emotions rising up from the inside of you that feel kind of serpent-like. Let's deal with those before you respond. So... Now, I got, like I said, I got blasted, and I'm going to give you the super short version of this, where we were able, because I employed one of the other strategies here I'm going to talk about in a second, um, by the time we got done with that conversation on Facebook, this person was, was, was inviting me to coffee or breakfast to talk more about what I actually thought about particular viewpoints on things with the church and politics. All because I did not choose to be provoked into a tit for tat. It's one of, one of the main strategies of the enemy. If you get nothing else in terms of strategy of the enemy today, one of the main strategies the enemy likes to employ is tit for tat. If I can get you into, um, into what David would call a brawl, if I can just provoke you, drop the gauntlet, here we go, let's, let's get into this, then, then the enemy actually has already won that particular round. All right. So we got to change the rules of engagement. we got to respond in the opposite. I'm going to get to that in just a second. Proverbs 15.1. Number two, release the opposite. So Proverbs 15.1 says, um, a gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. It's become one of my life verses over the last couple of years, and it basically means this. When somebody raises the temperature in the room, respond with a gentle answer. And please hear me. The reason Solomon wrote it is because it's counterintuitive. There's nothing about our intern. There's nothing about our. I should say. There's nothing about our flesh that is going to want to respond gently and in kindness when you're being attacked, but it's exactly what wisdom demands of us. So if we're going to be atmosphere shifters, if we're going to be people who don't come under an influence other than the Holy Spirit, we actually have to operate from this spot, and this spot answers gently. All right. Number three. If you can't find it in the life of Jesus, you have reason to question it. Meaning, if you are, um, if you're considering a course of action in response to a way that you've been provoked or in response to something that you're seeing or feeling, but you can't find that response in the life of Jesus, hold up. It probably, it probably isn't the way you want to go. <laughs> I'll refer you back to my comments on Elijah and John and James. Number four, here's my tweet of the day. John Chris likes to say this all the time on Instagram. Check your heart. Check your heart. Proverbs 4.23 says this, guard your heart with all diligence. Someone say all. The other word there is keep your heart. Guard your heart with all diligence for out of it spring the issues of life. What does this mean? It means that the degree to which I let things into my heart is also is going to inherently determine what gets out of my heart. I'll put it a different way. Anything that you allow access to in your heart will find its way out your mouth. Listen, um, if you've ever believed the lie, I'm just going to get over it. How, how many of you know that doesn't work? That either just leaves a wound that goes unhealed or it becomes something that festers into a root of bitterness that ends up defiling many. So what do I have to do? I have to literally cultivate an atmosphere in and around my heart that only allows kingdom influences into this place. Whew, man, okay. Learn to ask yourself this question. Why am I feeling this way? Everyone say that. Why am I feeling this way? 
Some of you all over this room, I feel like I, I feel like Holy Spirit's already bringing us to a place of conviction. It's guys, conviction from Holy Spirit is not meant to hurt you. It's not even meant to judge you or condemn you. It's actually meant to simply reveal the areas where you haven't believed God. That's it. And so, so if you're already starting to feel like the kind of like the the vice grip on your heart, it's only Holy Spirit saying, "Yo, like, this is you. Let's get right today." Why am I feeling this way? Is a great question to ask. Someone say eye gates and ear gates. Remember when we talked about senses trained to discern good and evil? More than any of the other physical senses that we have, the eyes and the ears have direct access to our heart. It becomes so important for people of God who are seeking Jesus, who are seeking the all of Jesus. Someone say the all. Come on, there's not a single person sitting in here that, that, ever, that ever came in here or ever came into any church and thought, I hope I just live a marginal life in Jesus. I hope I just get by. No, no, no. The book said he came that we would have life and life abundant. I think we signed up for abundant life. And if we're going to sign up for abundant life, then one of the things that we're actually going to have to do in this area of guarding our hearts with all diligence is I've got to know and I have to have, take an inventory in my life of what's getting in through my eyes and what's getting in through my ears. They're called eye gates and ear gates. And the reason I say that is because if I have an, an, uh, an abundance of certain types of information coming in through either one, please hear me, there's no way it's not going to affect your heart. I'll use a, an innocuous one, but I'm just going to drill down because we're talking about you know different governmental issues today. The... I can't spend three hours watching Fox News and three minutes reading my Bible and think that's not going to affect me. Because what's getting in through my eyes, what's getting through, in through my ears is going to impact what's going to outflow from my heart. All right. If that weren't enough. I need to create levels of clearance for those in my life. You ever heard, heard like some people talk about top secret clearance, classified, like this level clearance, this, that level clearance. We, we're actually in a season. This is another prophetic word that Dave is on right now that I, I, I truly feel is the Lord. We're in a season where um, I think it's Proverbs 13, 20 that says, he, um, he or she that walks with wise will be wise themselves. But the companion of fools suffers harm. And you and I, are in a season where we're being invited to take an inventory of who are the people in the people groups in my life that have the most access to my heart. Jeannie Mayo, a well-known um, youth pastor said years ago, she said, "If uh, show me your friends and I'll show you your future. Because the people group that I surround myself with is going to determine, in part at least, the trajectory of my life because if they're living substandard lives, I mean, I'm talking about Jesus as the standard. Please don't hear religion, okay? If, we're, if they're living substandard lives, that's going to give me permission to lower my level of expectation for myself to a place I don't want to be. But if I've got people surrounding me, cheering me on, and people who have only God's kingdom agenda for my life, those are the people I want accessing my heart. Those are the people I want speaking into my life. Those are the people that I want actually releasing those prophetic words, the ones that are being like, yes, that's God, do that. Number five, when you change locations, practice your spidey sense. Here's what I mean by that. When you go into a store, when you go, when you cross a city, county, or state line, homes, yours or others, uh, check your heart. Because you can very quickly begin to train your spidey sense to detect when atmospheres change. And guys, you can make a game out of it. If you got little ones, make a game out of it. Like you walk, you walk into a particular store, be like, hey, what do you feel? What's in your heart? What do you feel here? And you can begin to kind of check out, oh, okay. Now, for some of you, listen, I'm going to set some of you free, free right now. Some of you have a really strong, um, sometimes it's an intercessory gifting. Sometimes it's just a way that you hear things in the spirit. But sometimes you guys think you're nuts because you'll walk into a location. You'll have like a new flood of emotion that you didn't have a minute ago. And you're like, what is wrong with me? There's nothing wrong with you. You're a feeler. There's nothing wrong with you. 
You just stepped into another environment that had a different type of influence in that environment. Are you still with me? So some of you got to understand, and please, please, please talk to my wife, talk to Lisa, talk to Brenda. Like the, the, they'll, they'll talk you through how to like manage some of these things when you're, when you're in those zones. Um, but begin to practice those things. All right. I'm just going to ask you to place your hands on your heart. Just repeat after me. Holy Spirit, I receive your leadership today. I break every agreement I have had with other spiritual influences. I confess right now my desire to have no other voice of influence be stronger than yours. Amen. All right. So here's what I want to do. This is just as we close. Thanks. Is that Levi? Sounded like a Levi. Oh, it was next to Levi. All right. Um, prayer team, uh, uh, prayer team, I want you to come fast because I want to release an impartation. But because um, if last service was any indication that I wanted to, I want to make sure. Uh, and, and prayer team, come right here real fast. We're going to kind of do this um, football team or, you know, sports team style. Yeah, put, put your hands in the center here. Because, um, guys, I feel like I'm supposed to release an impartation this morning for a heart monitor. Um, and the Lord gave me a couple years ago, he gave me um, in my prayer time a specific, I'm not sure if it's an angelic um, visitation or if, it, or if it's a grace, but I've seen it manifest as both, um, a heart monitor anointing to be able, when you're provoked, when you're in those moments of high emotional turmoil, to be able to quiet yourself for a moment and to be able to ask Holy Spirit, okay, why do I feel this way? Um, and it is it has been gold for me. It has been one of the one of the most beautiful gifts God's ever given me. And so I want you to if that's if if it's something that you want to have imparted to you this morning, I'm going to release it to these guys so they can release it to everyone. I had a line of like 25 people in the last service. That's why I just want to make sure we multiply it. So God, I just release this right now, and you guys can even use some of these words when we're releasing it. I release the heart monitor anointing right now for every saint that re that receives this impartation through the laying on of hands. For every person here that desires to move into a new place of not being provoked, not moving in outbursts of anger, not moving in emotional ism, but being able to own our feelings and in the moment, in the moment, being able to quiet our soul and just ask the question, why do I feel this way? To be able to ask the question, Holy Spirit, what are you saying? What do you want to do? Amen. Amen. So you guys, yeah, if you can... Go ahead and fan out. So I'm going to be here to pray as well. But if that's you this morning and you just want a new breakthrough in this place of not coming under this influence, but being governed by this influence, you want that heart monitor, you, that's, that's like, you're like, I need that. I um, want, want to make us available to you to, to have that. You guys good? Is that okay? Love you. Love you. Love you. Thank you, Sean.